and she was given the 2007 Creative Scotland Award for her, her lovely collection of essays, Journeys Made on Foot, and this is all being gathered together for an anthology for Freight that's coming up next yes. year, which is fabulous. And you made those beautiful little standalone brochures that we have with us here. Yeah. How lovely. Also, much writing for radio and an editor of an anthology, A Wild, a wild Vein, and she lives and teaches creative writing in Highland Berkshire. And we have Jean Rafferty, who I met at the Whitton Festival when you were hosting a pen event, and I know you're going to be talking about pen for this evening too, Jean. And, um, and we said then, oh, it should be nice, how nice it would be for you to come to Dundee. And then the next, yes. and indeed it is. And then the next thing, of course, I heard nothing but amazing things about this book from Deborah Orr and uh, the Guardian generally, because you were shortlisted for the Gordon. inaugural. That was the first ever the Douglas the Gordon Byrne Prize. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so that made me even think even more. You must come along and talk because. Linda's book has this kind of dark little other spooky thing going on and you have spooky and dark in ladlefuls. I thought, <laughs> what a nice combination. So yeah, you're here to talk about chiefly your new novel, Linda, Call of the Undertow, and Myra, Beyond Saddleworth, is going to be the subject of your reading, Jean, tonight. Jean's a journalist and she's worked for, you know, all the big broadsheets, Sunday Times, Guardian, and she confesses and talks openly about the fact that dark subjects are subjects that take up her imagination, something that she wants to run with. Very interested in exploring in our discussion this idea of what is it that makes us want to follow a subject through. So, with that, a very warm welcome to Linda and Jean to Dundee. <laughs> I wonder if you might like to start by telling us a bit about where this wonderful book came from and, uh, and then to read from it a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I've realised actually that... Um, well, I think they're coming to this position. Oh, for the purposes of the film. Okay, I'll come round now. Yeah. Um, I've realised that this book is quite difficult to talk about before people have read it because... Um, because there's quite a lot of potential for spoilers. So I know Kirsty's read it, has anyone else read it? And there's this isn't to catch you out, but it's just knowing how much I, I should say. Um, but the, the, this is my first novel, uh, it, well, it's my first published novel, which is, there is a distinction, I, I did write a novel previously, which wasn't published. Um, and actually this, there were several different starting points for this novel. And I think generally that the way that I work, there's usually two or three things which mesh, and that's what kind of assures me that I'm in the right, I'm in the right kind of subject matter. Um, one of the central things is the place it's set in um, the far north east, Cape Towns, and um, a very particular place there that I've spent quite a bit of time exploring. It's very wild, isn't quite the right word, but it's. It's remote um, and it's vastly populated. So it's the kind of place where people can get kind of lost. And my character, Maggie, is somebody who wants to go somewhere where she can she thinks she can be exiled and kind of disappear. Um, but the place was a very much a starting point, and there was a particular story in the kind of local culture, several different versions of it, a folk tale which I used as a kind of basic structure for the story. And I can't say too much about that because I will, I will give too much away. <laughs> um, so so that, was, that was something that helped um, provide a starting point. But actually, the, the main character, Maggie, is a, she's a cartographer. And map, it maps are something that I'm really fascinated by. I love, I love maps. I can just ponder over them for many hours. And, um, one of the kind of big coincidences was that I discovered after I knew that this was the place I was going to write about and I had a notion about the character, I discovered that a very early Scottish mapmaker, Timothy Pond, had actually been a minister in the church in this particular area of the political 
done it. And all, the, all these kind of coincidences just seem to kind of mesh together in the same place. Um, and at the same time, I had, where I live in Abafaldi, a friend of mine's son, who was six at the time, did this, ex drew this extraordinary map of the local area. I mean, I was just absolutely blown away by it. I couldn't believe that a six-year-old could do such a map. And he just did it by walking around the town. And then he mapped it, and it was partly a, you know, there's this thing of children, you generally take quite a long time to be able to see things from above. And he'd done a mixture, at six, he'd done a mixture of the two. He'd done it partly from above and partly in elevation. So you've got the elevations of some of the buildings, but some of them are seen from above. And it was just such an extraordinary thing. And then that kind of meshed in as well with the story. Um, but I thought what I'd do is I'll just read you um, a bit from the second chapter of the book, which really introduces Maggie. Um, and if we've got time, I could read a little bit about when she first, first meets this rather unusual child called Trotty. It's really the relationship between them and its consequences is, is the subject of the, of the novel. Maggie had rented Flotsam Cottage, a single-storey steading conversion on the outskirts of the village, without viewing it. On a peninsula, practically an island, at a latitude of 58 degrees, as far north as places with ice names like Anchorage and Stavanger. The cottage had seemed right when she found it online, and she'd signed a six-month lease, a long enough horizon for her to aim for. In the days and weeks before moving, she'd kept a road atlas open on the kitchen table and looked at it while eating breakfast. A road atlas, usually castigated by people like her, for reducing landscape to a driver's myopia, had been exactly right for her needs. She toured her eye around the profile of the peninsula, saw it as an animal head, perhaps a cat, with the nose raised at the northeast corner, Duncansby Head. To the south of Duncansby was the great yawning mouth of Sinclair Bay, toothless, but opened wide as a wind screen, lined with a thin slice of yellow sand. West of Dunkettsby was a round bear like here, before the back levelled away into smaller lumps and bumps towards Dunnett Bay, a soft and vulnerable indent with its wide strip of sand, chink in the armour of what she took to be a rocky exterior. The place names were enjoyable to say aloud, unfamiliar and sibilant, Sipster, Staxigo, Slickly, Sordale. They sounded foreign, Skirza, Ulverster, left there by the Vikings probably, though from what she'd read, the Norse history of Cape Ness was forgotten now, only occasionally covered, uncovered when sand shifted from a Viking burial site. You're mad, her sister Carol said, when Maggie showed her the final page of the road atlas. The expanse of blank white paper, the few wiry roads, and the tiny shaded areas indicating settlements. Even I can read a map enough to see there's nothing there. It's not like you to be so remote. Instead of answering, she randomly reopened the atlas near the front, the south. Reading, Newbury, Basingstoke, Didcot, Southampton. The pages were a crazed circuit board of crossing wires, green or red for A roads, blue for motorways. Large shaded areas spoke of dense population. Carol frowned at the atlas, and Maggie closed it with a small thump strained line of understanding between them, as usual. Maggie's friend Helen was more polite. I've never heard of it, apart from that place, of course. She poked a finger at John Groves, known as the most northerly point, even though the map clearly gave this wrong to Dunnett Head further to the west. She bought a car, a second-hand Volvo. You're going to drive again? Carol's tone now sweetened sniffing her own agenda for Maggie of getting back to something. Easiest way to get there with my things, Maggie had said. No one tried to stop her, but she sensed the whispered conversations, the concern. Helen offered her help with packing up. Even after Maggie had stopped attending the joining in the community choir with both sons, Helen and Maggie maintained their ritual of meeting for a coffee and bun at their favourite deli afterwards. The chat, safely confined to weather, 
singing barns. She also tried to put Maggie in touch with friends she said lived in the far north. She wasn't the only one. They handed her pieces of paper with scribbled addresses and phone numbers. But the friends were usually in Inverness, 100 miles away, or even Perth, 200. They were hardly to be honest. Does Frank know? Carol asked. We're not married anymore. I know, Carol said, but he knows. She packed essentials into the car and pointed it towards that far corner of the country. Teeth gritted, radio up loud, crunching and digestion tablets. The first time she'd driven in two and a half years. Pulled north and north, with her left behind self snapping at her heels, but eventually dropping back and back, outpaced and shrinking as she passed Glasgow. The junctions thinning out, the land between settlements spreading. She stopped for a big break and put off in the darkening afternoon. Saw a hairdresser lolling an idol in her window. Went in and had her dark hair cut short there and then. She barely looked at its effect on her face in the mirror. Thought of it as a point of no return. Then beyond Inverness, fewer and fewer villages with chains of orange streetlights glowing out of the black and her breathing steadying. A road that rolled. A dark chasm now falling away to her right, and one or two solitary ship's lights out there in parallel journeys to her own. And finally, the car had brought her to rest in these flat, open lands of the peninsula, where there was nothing to hide behind. You could see so far, see your enemies coming. It was a relief to be so certain of her safety. That was, until the snowman had arrived. Um, so, um, so that's a kind of introduction to the main character, and it, the snowman kind of unsettles her. She thinks she's excluded, uh, secluded there, um, and the snowman's the first sign that she's not really going to manage to be that secluded. Um, I could read a little bit from where she meets the boy, Ooh, but um, shall I just great. introduce that briefly? Um, she, she's really against her better judgment. She's drawn into um, going to, into the primary, the primary school and giving a little presentation to the children um, about being a cartographer because they're doing a cartography project. And she notices while she's there this rather unusual looking boy, which she wasn't really sure at first whether he was boy. clearly separate from the rest of the children. Um, and then this is the first time she meets him properly. She's learned that his name is Trotham. Um, and she, this is her meeting him at the local harbour. A small figure stood on the pier. As she approached, she could see that the waves towing the wall's edge, almost overhanging it, were flowery. She hesitated, thinking she might still retreat, turn back the open beach where she'd intended to go next anyway, where anonymity was guaranteed. But the head turned, and she saw that the child was holding a pad of paper and a pencil. She walked to the end of the pier, admiring a stretch of blue ahead of her and the starburst splashes of gannet style. She turned, expecting to find a face buried in concentration, but although his hands were still poised over the paper, an amused, quizzical look was turned directly on her. Lovely day, she said. A ridiculous thing to say to a child. Where's your GPS? I don't really need it here, she laughed. You're not making a map? Not today, it's Sunday. I am. The child turned the face of his pad towards her, an invitation which drew her in to look over his shoulder. When she got close to him, she noticed his hair. It was almost damp looking, as if it had dried with the sort of water in it. She remembered that feeling from her family holiday. She stepped away slightly, but could still see the page that held a spider's web of fine pencil line. Despite the markings and remarkings, she could see that it was a bird's eye representation of the quarry town in the bay. Gosh, she said, stepping closer again despite her own resistance. Have you done that just by standing here? I went up there too. He pointed behind her to the small rise of Alwick Hill with its masts. Yes, she said, you get a great view. When she went up, she'd seen the buckhead of Dunnett lying along the horizon, 
I noticed how even the slight elevation widened bay into a shiny apron in front of him. The boy looked up at him. Did you hear any pipes? Pipes? Bagpipes? No. He went back to his drawing. Why? she asked. He giggled into his sketchbook. There was a man called Peter Barker, he said. He was up there with his cows and met a lady in a green dress. When? she asked. I wasn't wearing a green dress. The boy laughed, his fringe tossing out his squinting eyes. He'd fallen asleep for a moment amongst the flowers. She said he could have a Bible with pipes. Ah, I see. And he chose the pipes. He didn't know he could play them, but it turned out he could. His cows did a wee dance when he started to play. Maggie smiled. Except he had to go back and meet her in the same place seven years later. Uh-oh, she sensed the story was about to take a bad turn. The boy looked up, didn't continue immediately. And? Did he ever return home? No, said the boy. That's a very sad story then. The boy turned his head up to her, one eye piercing the gap in the straggling friend. Why? Well, for his family, his friends, never to see him again. The boy shrugged. She was very beautiful. Okay, thank you, Linda. That's given us a lovely little taster for discussion that can follow. But let's now turn to you, Jean. I loved it that you read the section that shows the drive through the night and the sense of these headlights and the land falling away into darkness, because that is a recurrent motif that comes up through this book. Can you tell us where this amazing book came from? Um, the M62 motorway. <laughs> um, I was driving across it and I hadn't been across it and it's, it, it, it is very dramatic. It was one of those things that um, a lot of different things that I've been interested in all my life kind of came together. So I probably read practically every serial killer biography that there is. I, I'm kind of drawing the line at Jeffrey Dahmer because chocolate and serial killing, I, I think that might put me off chocolate, so um, <laughs> I've left him to the moment, but everybody else I have read, and I've read them through the years, and um, I suppose that came from, um, there was, a, there was a, a, a guy called Peter Manuel who was killing in, in the Lanarkshire area. I lived in Glasgow, and he was killing ordinary people in their houses, and he was going into their houses. And um, my father was very, very um, anxious about this. He was quite an anxious man, my father. And I guess it kind of transmitted itself to me. And later on, I read things about Manuel. When he killed the people in the house, he, he opened the fridge and, and he ate a whole lot of pineapple chunks out of the tin. And that just, that kind of very, bizarre human thing of eating after you've just killed a lot of people. I suppose that's the kind of thing that drew me in. Ooh. A really intellectual response to <laughs> this. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> but I think but I think that what you've done with this book is you've taken a real life story and you've set something upon that that is purely fictional. Can you give us a little introduction to the book and then maybe like Linda read us a couple of passages that give us a sense of it. Um, well, um, the book um, is, it, it, the starting point is my Lindley's death. Um, so the actual Mur Moore's murders are, are only running along in the background. The main story is what happens when, after she dies and the, the premise is that she didn't really die, that um, the government had given her a new identity and you know, witness protection or whatever it is, whatever it is you know, that kind of um, security. Um, they've given her a new life, a new identity. And really, it follows her through that new life. And I've given her affairs, um, an affair with a younger, rather upper-class woman. I think the thing that, that, that made me make some of the decisions was that Myra Hindley was always looking for things that were different from everybody else around her. So Ian Brady was a Scot, he was very arrogant, he wore tailored suits, he had very esoteric interests, he was exactly the sort of person that would intrigue 
mother than me. Um, so she, the woman she fancies in church, uh, turns out to be an upper class young woman. Um, then she has an affair with a priest. So it's always she's always looking for something that goes that goes across boundaries, and, and I suppose that's what I've, um, I think these murders were. Um, a lot of, um, Ian Brady led a lot of philosophy over it, and people would say, oh, that was just an excuse. And um, what I would say is I think that it was integral to it, that he had this sense of um, wanting to break boundaries, wanting to go beyond the norm, wanting to be more courageous uh, than anyone else. And of course he's chosen one of the most cowardly ways to do it, if you like, you know, to, to, to pick young younger people. Um, I don't think that they specifically set out originally to, um, to pick on children. Um, his, his, their first victim was a 16 year old um, so I, I don't know what, what people think about that I don't think of 16 as a child because in Scotland you've always been able to get married at that age so, but that girl fought so hard Pauline Reed fought so hard that they then decided that they would pick something easier you know? so although mentally in his head he was doing this thing that was breaking boundaries he was doing it with the most vulnerable people, um, which I, I suppose is why people object to the book at all. You know, they, they don't they don't think that somebody like him should get any kind of a, a, a voice whatsoever. I, I still correspond with them as a former journalist. I always do research, you know, and as he was alive, I thought I'll write to him. And, see what he's got to say and he said very little about the murders but um, I recently sent him some DVDs and they were returned to me and it, you know that seems punitive to me um, they're mainstream what they're mainstream adult films but you know they're not anything that was particularly um, you know, grotesque or anything, it's not horror or anything like that. So I'm kind of um, debating whether I lodge a complaint about that because somebody, although he's done something inhuman and awful, he doesn't cease to be a human being. And I suppose that's part of what I'm saying in the book. You know, these these people, they weren't always out serial killing. <laughs> Sometimes they were eating chops for their tea and things like that. I'm interested in this too because he was from Glasgow, I suppose, and um, there'd be quite a number of, of Scottish serial killers, possibly above the, uh, the, the norm. You know, I think we're quite a violent society. I wonder if you might read us a section, mm -hmm. give us a flavour of the book. Now this, this is. Um, a sort of edited version um, of one of the chapters. It's um, a certain place called St. Blaine's. I don't know if anybody knows it. It's on Butte. And it's a place that's kind of very special um, to me because I found it when I was um, 12. I was out with my dad. We were on holiday. Everybody else had gone somewhere else. I don't know where. It was just me and my dad on our bikes and we found this place and at that time it, it's an old mo ruined monastery at that time it was completely overgrown um, and it just it was a very hot day and it just had this wonderful atmosphere about it so when I thought of a place Brady and Hindley were often going up to Scotland driving about he loved the scenery and so on so when I thought of a place which one could make profane, which he would make profane, St. Blaine's was it. Um, <laughs> I think I'm not the only person that, that loves it. My cousin phoned me up after reading the book. She said, they didn't really go to St. Blaine's, did they? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> so it's 
So this is St. Blaine's, September 1964. Um, and when I do Myra Henley's voice, what she was a Manchester woman, but she always tried to um, speak posh. So I can't manage that, I'm afraid. It's in my head, but it's, <laughs> she's going to be quite Scottish. But if you can just bear that in mind. Uh, it's hot. Brady leans back against the car, sucking a blade of grass. One ruined church looks much the same as another to him. Em's walking along the wall, skirt tucked up. Her legs are strong, and a light golden colour you don't expect from an English girl. Maybe she's some coloured blood in her. Not nigger blood, you wouldn't stay with her if you thought that. Maybe something exotic like Burmese or Malayan. He lights a cigarette, letting it dangle between long, elegant fingers. Funny thing, heredity. But he and Em should be so different, yet so much the same. She with her sturdy farm girl's build, and he like a concert pianist. Yet they are the same, both shunted out of their own parents' homes, both willing to explore things that most people would be too chicken to contemplate. At least she knows her father. If Brady ever saw his father, he'd give him a kicky, spit in his bloody face, deserting his wife and kid like that. That's not a man. A man accepts responsibility. His father is just a ponce, some middle-class twat coddled by his family. Not that he blames him, really. Who wants a woman and a squawking kid hanging around? Being a journalist would be a much more interesting life. It'd be good to know where his father ended up. Did he see the world? Or did he not get further than Glasgow? Did he work for a quality paper? Or just one of those scummy tabloids? Brady could have been a journalist himself if he'd had the chance to stay on at school. He was clever enough. But they didn't do that in the Sloan family. Once you got to 15, you'd turn your keep. Everyone was the same down the bottles. Fair enough. They looked after him and he wasn't even their flesh and blood. Ma Sloan always used to say it didn't matter, that she loved him as much as her own children, but he knew it wasn't true. She was a good woman, Ma, but he never fooled himself that she cared for him the way she did for her own. It's not bad, this place. You can see right across to Adam from here. Monks built it, but it's overgrown now. Emma's walked right round the wall and come full circle. She jumps down and stands in front of them, with that challenging way she has, like she's going to say something that'll fetch her a smack. She wants to watch out. She might get one. The guidebook said something about a dreaming tree, but I can't see one. Lovers would come and eat its leaves together to see if they'd get married or not. We don't need a sodding tree to tell us whether we'll get married. We're not. Who needs that kind of bourgeois rubbish? He leans back, watching her through his dark glasses. He knows she'll come to him. She does. Presses herself up against him. He lets her make the running. She unbuttons her shirt and pulls her bra down so he can see her bare flesh. They're not scared someone will come along and see us. Makes it more exciting, doesn't it, she says. I like it when you do things in the dark. Behind the glasses, he closes his eyes. It's as warm now as it was the day of the last one, in June. The boy in the ravine. In his mind, he can hear the wheezing sound the child made as the string squeezed the breath from his body, the way his skin was warm to the touch. Brady holds himself very still, remembering the fucking glory of that moment, riding him like a bucking bronco, him thrusting, the boy face downward and her, standing above, watching. Control. He must stay in control. He moves away from her. Stop it. I don't want to be caught here with you looking like some cheap tar. She jerks away. Who do you think is going to come to this godforsaken place? Hardly godforsaken. It's a monastery. Oh, very funny.
He walks over to the wall she was walking around, a circle of massive stone blocks overrun with nettles at centre. What is this anyway? It's called the Devil's Cauldron, so you should be at home in it. He stands on top of the wall and looks down at her. Oh, I am. He unzips his trousers. This is supposed to be a holy place, she says. Good. Here's what I think of that. He releases a long arc of piss into the centre, watching with satisfaction as the golden liquid spills over the nettles. She starts to snigger, but nervously, hand over her mouth. What's the matter? Afraid your God is going to smite me down? You know I don't believe in God, she says. But he doesn't know anything of the kind. He suspects she indulges in that histrionic Catholic stuff when his back's turned. What is it about women that they can't stick to things? They've got no self-discipline, no staying power when it comes to abstractions. They can't stand the idea of a universe with no one in it to look after them. They'll always go scurrying back to their beloved holy water from the candles. But what God worth the salt, if he existed of course, would pay any attention to a puny little flame flickering in some suburban vestry when he has the stars and the sun at his command, when the strongest power in the world is the black light hidden inside the human heart. Yeah, I wonder if we might kick off the conversation then between the two of you and from and all of us about this rubbing up of the unsettling and the quotidian. Now obviously with your book, Jean, we have that happening very dramatically. And this is a book that's it's constructed as a kind of uh, range of, we've got a range of voices as you just read. We hear from Ray, we hear from Henry herself, we hear from the point of view of her mother. Maya's mother, um, the lover and so on. We've got all kinds of points of view. Your book, Linda, is very much coming from Maggie's perspective. Um, and we've got this sense in your book of there's this unease, this unsettling, there's this strange fairy-like child, very other, and she's drawn into something, she's drawn away from her day-to-day -day life into this potential secret. And of course, there's also a secret that she's running from that has its own darkness. When you're creating characters, both of you, could you talk a little about how you inhabit them to be able to do both of those things? Because doing one or the other is fine and sort of straightforward, I think. But to bring both those tones into a character is challenging. What by both do you mean? Well, this idea of around. accessing the dark and mm. the uncanny mm -hmm. and the, the, the scare, there's, a, there's something very scary about your book too. And of course, it's nothing like mm -hmm. touching on the lives of serial killers, but it's a very unsettling, um, scary book. It rattles at your windows. So, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I guess in the character of Maggie, um, the way that she developed her kind of storyline was that was was one of suppression because she's this thing that's happened in the, in the past. She hasn't really dealt with it, and um, and that's why she's running. But there's a sense that she's got to keep it down, otherwise it's going to come up and bite her. You know, it's, um, so that there was always in my mind as she on the page, she always had that kind of duality of a sort of darkness and the ordinariness, quite practical, she was just quite a practical person really. Um, and I just think, I don't know, I'm not quite sure how in terms of inhabiting her as a character and understanding both those sides, I'm not really sure how that happened. Well, can I ask a specific question? Because it seems that something that both of you share is that you give your protagonists lots of stuff. You give them lots of kind of material stuff to do. I'm thinking about her baking. Mm. I'm thinking about the way she is, the way she inhabits the rented cottage with Myra. There are the outfits. You know, the sense of her moving into her new home and how she might, you know, use that. 
I think, is there something about that, that, that you deliberately seek out these kinds of accessories, these very ordinary material things, to create something that seems normal? I mean, is that a deliberate... I, I wouldn't say that, I don't know about you, Jean, but I wouldn't say that I did that in order to create the, the deliberateness, but she, she does develop this kind of sort of ritual of bread making and the kneading of the dough is really important. Mm. And it's, it's almost like that that's a time when there's something going on with her hands and a rhythm that she could be more herself. It's, there's a comfort in it and there's a contemplation that goes on at the same time. That was partly why that was that was there in the walking. She she ritually kind of walks and goes back to the same places over and over again. And I, I guess there was some mm. of, some of it on that as well. Although that has a sort of slightly different function as well because she begins to feel very kind of grounded in the place and to respond quite positively to the place. Um, and yeah, so I suppose I suppose they do. You know, those the ordinary things and. The, and you know, getting used to a new, a new home is, mm. is quite a kind of, that is quite a thing that we've all experienced, isn't yeah. it? So most people can... But it seems to me that by choosing those themes, you're kind of highlighting the unhoused aspect of your characters. Mm. Jean? Well, I suppose I, my, my choices were more deliberate in a sense, and uh, a lot of people think, you know, with fiction that it's very organic. And, some, and, and obviously is. But before I even started, I had to make choices about this um, because everybody, Maya Hindley is in the public domain, everybody has their own Maya Hindley. So mine had to match enough with what people understood her to be. And so I had to make a huge choice right at the beginning. Um, did I think she repented or not? Mm. Now, if she had repented, I would have had a different plot line. I mean, it comes down to as basic a craft thing as that, I think, you know. There would have been um, more discovery, there would have been a discovery of her, perhaps. There would have been people, you know, being as violent to her as she had been in the past. Um, and we would be expected to sympathise with her. But when I did the research, I, I, I couldn't believe that she did actually repent in any true sense. So that was the first choice I had to make. And my preference also was for, you know, as you say, the quotidian. I wanted everything to be, um, although I like to write in, in a, a supposedly very dramatic way, I don't, I didn't want to use great big events. I wanted it to be, um, as unsensationalist, if you like, as you could be with the subject matter, because the Moors Mortals themselves were some of the most, um, not just terrific, I think resonant, and they're resonant for particular reasons, those, those murders, and they're resonant because the children were buried out on the moor, and I think most people, it's, it's, it's irrational, I think most people, including myself, look at that and go, oh my God, those poor little children out in that desolate place. And I think that's what's really made the murders stick. So that in itself was, that, like Linda, I wanted a sense of place to be tugging away all the time. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called Beyond Saddle. When somebody said to me, you've got to admire it in the title. I, I just was going to call it beyond the Oh, it was interesting. Um, and that, you know, she's got drawn back, we're drawn back, it, it's it's a huge part of it. I mean, in real terms, of course, she would never be put anywhere near Saddleworth mm -hmm. in that wooden scene, you know, but this is fiction, I don't have, you know, there are rules that one has to be, but they're not rules of reality. And you could give her plastic surgery and change everything about her so that she's unrecognisable apart from her walk. Yes. That's an amazing moment. But both of you have this thing of like, there's definitely tension. I mean, as you say, the murders themselves are a backstory that are fed in in these little increments as you gave in your reading. Um, but you both got this tension where we think something truly awful is going to happen. You know, 
know, there's a real sense of dread and foreboding around the figure of this child and where it's going to take us. And we have a kind of an element of stalking with Myra and uh, the young woman. Both these things are made to feel very, very sinister and create a great deal of tension in the reader without giving anything away to those who haven't read and would like to. Um, could you talk a bit about how you manage that in terms of a craftsmanship, maybe starting with you this time, Jean? Um, well, uh, I think actually my journalism helped with this because um, in journalism you're cutting away all the time. So in a sense, although it's quite a long book, um, I was cutting, trying to cut away things so that there were just these little vignettes and there were there are actually three kind of strands to it. You know, there's there's the story of Maya coming out of prison, there's the story of Grady um, grooming her in the past, and there's also the story of some people who have connections with her and there's a connection with the Iraq war and there's a kind of parallel story that echoes her um, her relationship with Brady, only this time I reversed it. It's the young woman who draws the young man in. Um, so with that amount of, of complexity of plotting, I had to actually, I mean, I actually literally wrote a real timeline and a book timeline uh, so, and, so that I could keep control of those three elements. So mm -hmm. it was quite carefully plotted in that sense. Um, taking things away. I mean, some once it was done, quite a few chapters went. You know, um, and every time I come to reading, I think I wish I'd just trimmed a bit more. <laughs> 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 because uh, you know, when you read, it's not well. Linda's just read straight out of her book, which I'm impressed by. This no, it's got lines through. All oh, right, <laughs> <laughs> but you write for you write for the pages slightly different, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Linda, would that be the same for you, this idea that tension is created by flensing away and um, reduction? Uh, yeah, yes and no, because sometimes I think I underwrite, and so um, some of the feedback that I had was suggesting that, that I needed to actually say a little bit more rather than less um, on certain things. Mm. Um, but I think on the, the first draft there probably wasn't much tension in it, I would say. I think the tension kind of came through the redrafting process, and I wrote a timeline as well because I it, the same sort of feeling that I needed to kind of take control of the material and work out what happened when and how all the bits fitted together. But my, you know, my because it's one point of view and it's um, there is stuff in the past, but it mostly happens in a relatively short space of time. It wasn't the same complexity that you've got with your multiple points of view. Um, but I think, in terms of the tension, I think some of it is more probably case of the imagery, and with the boy particularly, because um, you know Maggie becomes very emotionally attached to this child, but there's a sense that this is dangerous for her to do this, and um, he's quite unknowable. Really, I suppose that's the thing, and that. She, every time she seems to think that she's got to know him, he does something which makes her have to reassess him. Did, mm, was, no, it, you know, was it him that yeah. built the snowman, or was it him that did this or that? And um, some of you know some of the imagery is things like you know, he could be an angel, he could be a gargoyle, you know that kind of thing. But you know, she can't quite know what he is. Um, so I suppose my hope would be, from the reader's point of view, that some of the imagery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this kind of shifting of goalposts as she goes forward. And the same with the plays, that just as she's discovered the place and thinks she's kind of got a sense of always, almost a sense of being at home in this landscape, it turns on her and you know, there's, a, there's a, um, something that happens to her when she's on the beach, which is quite hostile and mm -hmm. quite scary. So, and that's just as she as she's feeling comfortable. So I suppose it's this unknow the unknowability of her surroundings and the people around her, the unpredictability of it. Um, mm -hmm. And some of that, I would say, is stage managed. You know, it's kind of how far can you keep something going until you kind of create another kind of level of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the new 
new drafting and there were multiple, multiple <laughs> drafts of it. It was a case of knowing when to plant certain ideas and certain images um, and link the link to the events in the past, how that kind of information was released as well. Mm. Would you both, would you like to contribute any questions or thoughts? I don't know mm. what you've well, this is probably several <coughs> questions. I was wondering about your position and how much you feel yourself you're a transgressor even for just going here and how much readers <laughs> find you the transgressor for going here. That's an issue for you at the outset. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tend to think that as a writer I'm entitled to write whatever I want and um, I suppose that's one of the reasons I I find the pen work, um, I'm so um, passionate about that, is that um, I think that at the moment we're in a society which is tamping down everything. Um, it's very conformist, it's very, you're not allowed to say certain things in, in our society and I discovered that as a journalist. Um, I would go and do something, what, one of the stories that I did um, for many years I tried to get stories out about satanic ritual abuse, as in Orkney and so on. And when you speak to ordinary people and you say, I think this happened, you go do you so do I, there's no smoke without fire. But if you go into a newspaper and try to get a story out about that rubbish, they prefer they prefer certain archetypes, you know, they prefer to look at um, victimised parents. Um, uh, innocent people, because also it's cheaper. They're not going to be they're not going to be taken to court for libel or anything like that. So, um, so when I came to write this, um, I was actually doing it at the university. I was doing it with um, Zoe Wickham, who's um, at the University of Strathclyde, and she's. What you have to do is this critical essay, which is a bit stretch for me. Oh no. I just want to find out. Could you maybe just ask them to wait for five minutes again? What a shit game. Oh, there are so many future rooms that are available. We can relocate. Well, Gail's got a film running. Mm. And this is going to be, I mean, the planning writing people are going to kick themselves for not being here. Mm. This is a stuff mm. about. Planning and structure. <laughs> well, I tell you what, somebody's telling me that Dickens wrote a plan for Bleak House. I'm desperate to get a hold of it. I've been all over the internet. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, and I think maybe he did it for all of them. It's always intriguing. You know, how did he do that and knock them out in these instalments? But we could have you just talk for 10 minutes about timelines. I mean, I don't even know what a timeline is. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that many of our students need to know about it, you know, because of the way they're managing multiple plots and this business of, you know, vocality and multiple voices and so on. Um, is it possible for us to stay on or for them to find another room? Um, they're not very keen. Right. Oh, so flexible. Well, do you want me to go down and find out another weekend? I can go. I think we'll just camp in another room, won't we? Oh, just like just not, not oh are they? Oh. Okay, I'll go down and find out. Could you? Just, I think we need another 15 minutes, don't we? Mm. Mm. I'm so sorry, Linda. Oh, Jean, will you ever come back? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Feels very shabby. Get to talk about our own books. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> I think you should do loads of events. <coughs> it's interesting because I mean we we've never put the two books together yeah, and really we've not connected all. them at all. But now you you know. You're and we're we're both actually merged again because Linda's book um, has got. Well, I'm allowed to say. Yeah, well, that's what you must spell that, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I want to say. Oh, and Phil, what? Can we know? No, we're not allowed to. No, it's just one of the things that I was trying to keep quiet about in the book. Yeah. Well, don't oh, say. I see. Don't okay. Say. Yeah, yeah. No, don't say. No, no, don't. Yeah. Yeah. Jean's got it. <laughs> I've been working on I've worked some, uh, yeah. a novella on this. Oh. Uh, not, on, not on the same lines, no cartography or anything, but. Um, oh similar kind of response to Scottish culture. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. Facts of who you knew him to be in his own 
Yeah, yes, I mean, I, I, I put him in situations I don't know if he's yeah. been in and, mm -hmm. and so on, but some of them, most of the, the situations in, in the backstory of, of in the 60s are based on mm -hmm. real events, um, most of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, the ones when he's in prison, not so much. I mean, I knew he was force-fed and... So that, that comes into it, though I, I wasn't expecting him not to be keeping to his hunger strike, which is what emerged at that, that mental health hearing. Yeah. But if you had a, a correspondence with, with him, that must have given you an intense kind of insight. Yes. I mean, at some point you have the journalist you know, commenting on her interest in doing just that. Mm -hmm. And she, said, she makes, a, she makes a, uh, a remark about the kind of writing men like that or criminals like that to sort of exhibit. Mm, yeah. kind of, those kinds of details and moments give the whole project an enormous sort of sense of veracity. Well, his part really mm. was, you know, he, he, his, he, he did love Dostoevsky and used all of those things and mm. sad and all of these things were markers for him, mm. you know, so. Mm. Quite unreadable to sad, I find, but, <laughs> you know. You're sad as burn. Oh, it's um, disgusting, <laughs> the bits I've read. Uh, three, three times in, in your spiel you, you told us that she hadn't recanted, mm. which is the word you used. Yes. Um, this is a religious word. Yes. So how do you perceive my Henry? Is she um, a damned soul? in the old sense of the word, or is she redeemed I, somehow? I, I don't think she was redeemed very much. Um, I don't really think in religious terms myself. Um, so why did you reach for the word repentance instead of saying she was never sorry? I think that that's, I think that's kind of crucial to people's understanding of it. I think that's the key question. You know, when you're talking about somebody like that, she was in prison an awful lot of years, and people think, well, you know, she had time to reflect. But when you look at what she did in prison, you know, the correspondence shows that she was very self-centered. Um, there's one letter where she, she talks about the West family and said, this family have haunted and hunted me for 22 years. Now, <laughs> that's not the sign of anyone that cares about anything other than their own life. So that, I mean, it, it, to me it's the key question about her, about creating that character. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you, you know, much fiction I think is exploration, um, but I couldn't, I had to explore that before I actually even started writing, because it has such a huge, for me, it would have had such a huge impact on the plot. Mm. Mm, yeah, and, and just how I, her. Mm. Can I ask another question about transgression to continue that theme? You've transgressed, Linda, in the sense that you've written about a part of the world that, you know, as you say, is sparsely populated, um, remote from any people, and you've written about it with utter authority. You know, so I think the, one of the great pleasures of Call of the Undertow is that we absolutely feel that we're there. And you know, for those of us who know that part of the world, everything is rendered with utter you know, feeling of uh, recognition and reality. It's got total sort of 3D quality. And yet you're not from that part of the world. Mm. I know that your walks, you're walking on foot. I bumped into Linda one summer, windswept and on a bike <laughs> outside the Wick railway station. I was equally windswept, I have to say. Um, but, but I know that that these are issues. You talked about the reading that you gave up in Cape Can you talk about that, the outside yeah. and inside of it? Um, well, I, I think, actually, it hadn't, it hadn't really occurred to me much as an issue because I've often written about places that I have no, you know, ownership of, if you like. And ownership's not quite the right word, but I don't belong to the place. I've, I've done that a lot. And I suppose my way of belonging to a place is by exploring what you saw on foot. Um, and so it wasn't particularly new to me that I was writing about a place which I have 
you know, little connection to other than visit, as a visitor. But it, the first time, when I actually knew that it was going to get published, because I wrote this book without any real sense that it was going to get published, because that liberated me, because I'd had a lot of self-consciousness when I'd written the novel that didn't get published. Um, it was like, oh, right, I've got to write a novel, right, what shall I write it about, and what's the plot, and that kind of thing. It was very artificial. So this one I thought, I'm just going to go with it, and I'm just going to write it and enjoy it. So I, I didn't have any kind of self-consciousness about how is this going to be received in the place that it's written. And the first time I actually thought about it was I was up there this Easter and I hadn't completely, I knew it was going to be published by that stage, but I hadn't totally finished the revisions for the publisher. And my partner actually said to me, you realise you're not going to be able to come back? <laughs> I thought, oh! <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just hadn't kind of thought about it in those terms. And... Um, I mean, there's a sort of, I guess the way that I've presented this particular community, there is a negative reading of it, there's a positive reading of it as well, but it depends how you read it. Um, and so I was a bit, a bit anxious about when the book came out, about its reception there, because it's a place that matters to me quite a lot. I didn't feel like it's sort of totally just go, it doesn't matter what they thought, they're just 200 people or whatever. Um, and I did go and do an event, not actually right in the village. I've, I've renamed the village, but it is very much um, identifiable. I've cha changed certain things about the village for the purposes of the story and to distance it a bit for myself, actually. It helped me to call it something else, just to distance it a tiny bit. But the place is completely identifiable. Um, and when I when I went back, I was I was nervous about doing a reading there, because I thought, oh, they hate me. Mm -hmm. But actually, it was the, the event itself was in Thurso, which is about six miles away, and they were very nice to me, um, and they hadn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> so now I can't go back. <laughs> but I did, ha I did have a bit of feedback from a couple of people, one who's from that area and one who um, lives there and they both managed to enjoy it and not made any comment about the authenticity of it as a place. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, I was aware of inventing, you know, it's my, it's my invention, that place, really, because I didn't know the community that I was writing about. I just invented a community and put it in that geography. So it is invented. Um, and I suppose the danger is that people who really live there would think, oh, that's our interpretation of our community. Yes. You know, that's the danger. Um, I suppose that was what made me a bit kind of nervous about it. There's this issue, isn't there, of what can be used. And I loved your introduction, Jean, when you talked about the fact that you're a writer. Mm -hmm. That means you can do anything <laughs> you want, and you can use anything you want. And that very phrase, you know, don't, don't, I don't want to feel used, or what, what can be used and what can't be used, these things don't put, put in. Can I say to both of you what a great pleasure it's been having you come to study and talk to us. And Jean, if you can finish uh, with a little talk to us about the empty chair and what it represents. But before you do so, if we can all thank Jean Rafferty and Linda Crackman for coming to study and talk mm -hmm. about their wonderful books. Um, well, uh, we're both um, members of Scottish Pen, and um, everywhere um, we go, we try to um, bring the empty chair, um, which represents the writers that can't be here because they're maybe persecuted or in prison, death threats for for just saying what they think perhaps of their government or the, the society around them. Um, this chair is a, a replica of one which was made for the Writers in Prison Committee um, by the pupils of Lone School in Helensborough and they designed it and everything. I think it's uh, very, very fine and we're very lucky to be able to take it around and just remind people um, because we take, it, we take it for granted that we can say what we want. Um, I don't think that we can. I think there are, are economic pressures in this country and, um, that are perhaps we don't acknowledge enough but um, we certainly have more freedom than many.